Hey everybody, welcome to another episode of the Universe Within podcast. On this episode, I sat down with a new friend of mine. Uh, her name is Ann Lohr, and I had known about her for a while. We, we have uh, at least one mutual friend, and we do similar work. Uh, she is now working in a center called Shipibo Rao, uh, which is a center founded by a gentleman who I've worked with named Jose Lopez Sanchez. I've done a, a lot of work with his family. Um, I interviewed a, a few people in his family on previous episodes of this show. Uh, I did one episode with his sister, Lila, and another episode with his mother and his two sisters, Ines being the mother, and the two sisters, Laura and Lila. So I have a lot of respect for that family, and um, I had worked with Jose before, and I, I recently worked with him again at, at his center, uh, where I did a, a, a dieta, um, and he's... Uh, he, that family, I have a lot of respect for. I think they do really good work. They they carry a really strong lineage. Um, and I met Ann Lohr through that center. And she's a facilitator there. Uh, she helps Jose with his work. And uh, just a really fascinating story. She's been involved in this work for a long time. Um, if I remember correctly, I think she said since 2009, uh, maybe she's been here, but I think she's been working in, the, in these fields even longer. And she has a really rich and varied history. She's been doing a lot of uh, medicine work and different paths, different traditions. And for the last number of years, she's been really involved in the, the Shipibo healing system, specifically working with ayahuasca, with master plants, and with this idea of doing a dieta. So I sat down with her in Pucallpa, where uh, Pucallpa in Peru, it's one of the, the jungle cities uh, uh, around the area where the, the Shipibos come from. And we had a really nice chat. I think it went about two and a half hours or so. And um, I think you all will really enjoy this uh, episode. She she went pretty deeply into the, the, the Shipibo path of working with ayahuasca, speaking from her own experience. And uh, she has a lot of knowledge to share. share. She's, she's very humble and... Um, and yeah, she, I think she has a lot to teach. So I think and hope you all will really enjoy this episode. As always, if you're able to support this podcast, that's a really big help to me to continue to bring on these guests. Um, Patreon is a really good option to do that. It's a website and it's kind of like a subscription service. There's different tiers you can sign up for. For as little as a dollar a month, you can become a member. And those different tiers give you different things back. Uh, things like early access to shows, bonus material, Q&As. Uh, I really like the idea behind that, which uh, I think is, is very much built on the Shipibo principle, which they call Aki Ninanti, or, or in, in Quechua Aini, this idea of reciprocity. So if you feel like you're gaining something from this podcast, that's a, a really nice way to, to give back and to show support. So I'll put a link to that in the show notes. There's also the option to direct donate via PayPal. Um, also with the YouTube option, uh, there's the option to join the channel now. And if you're not able to do that, as always, some of the really small things like just hitting the subscribe button, uh, turning on the notification bell, liking the videos if you're watching these on YouTube, uh, if you're listening to the audio version, going on Apple, Spotify, um, leaving a starred rating and a short review, that's a really big help. Also with Spotify now, there's the, the ability to rate the show as well. So um, I think that's it. Uh, my next guest after this episode is actually going to be with Jose, with Jose Lopez Sanchez. Uh, and that was a really good interview. He has a, a really beautiful way of expressing himself, expressing the ideas of the Shipibo and the Cosmovision and his own experience. So that was an interview I, I really enjoyed too, and that will be coming out uh, on the next episode. So I think that's it. And without further ado, here is my conversation with Ann Lohr. Yeah. Yeah. Great. So, uh, 
I had I had heard of you before because for many years I, I worked at the the Temple of the Way of Light, mm -hmm. and uh, so maybe it was through Debbie or through some other people. Um, but then just recently we we finished a dieta. You were you were facilitating the dieta with Jose, and yeah, I thought it would be amazing to have you on and. Maybe to start, uh, I mean, this podcast is mostly about, obviously, plants and plant work, but maybe to start just a bit about who you are, where you came from. We, I, I know we talked a little bit one night about some of your background, and it's super fascinating. So just kind of what, what eventually led you, not just in this path of working with, with ayahuasca and diets, but, but all of the other things that, that happened in your life to kind of lead you to this point. Mm. Mm -hmm. um, Everything from stitching yurts together to, to the red path and yeah. <laughs> mm. Mm. Where do I stand on? Um, well, give me a second to just just to see at what point I start. Mm. Mm, You're Belgian. I'm Belgian. Yes. <laughs> I was I was born in Canada, and um, my my parents are doctors, and so they they went to Canada and, and to to study, and um, so, but I was raised in Belgium, and um, in the countryside. Your parents are are Belgian. Or they are Belgian. Yeah, my whole family is Belgian. I'm the only Canadian in the family. Yeah, and um, so I think from a very young age, I had the curiosity of what was the purpose of the purpose of all of this. I mean, it was really for me it was the the countryside that I lived in that just kind of really inspired that question because it was just so amazingly beautiful and I just remember one specific moment where I was just kind of in awe of the beauty you know in my back garden I was I don't know nine ten years old something like that and I was I thought because I come from a very um, you know traditional typical classical family you know everybody went to university so the path was just kind of really clear you know you go to school you go to university, you get married, you have two children in the house, a cat, a dog, and you work <clears throat> pension, and then you just, you know, hopefully enjoy a little bit and then die. And um, I never really um, found that I fit it in that. Um, first of all, I had always, you know, um, um, I was the artist in the family. I was the smallest one of all, and just somehow they kind of left me, you know, uh, with that, which was really good, there was not like much expectations about me, but I didn't really know what my path was. But I, there was this day when I just, I was, you know, just yeah, really amazed by the by the whole beauty of everything, and I think there must be something else uh, behind all of that, you know, a bigger purpose um, for the all the creation to be. And then I just remember that day, just kind of really making the. Um, yeah, just the promise to myself that um, I wanted to know what was behind all of that. And then you obviously left it there, you know, I kept going with my childhood and grow. But I had always um, an interest into, um, yeah, just kind of understanding, you know, what was behind all of that. Um, Religion-wise, religion I obviously, you know, come from a Catholic, you know, background. But my parents weren't really into that and my mother was always very, um, maybe not always, but you know, from early on, she was very open to discover, you know, explore different things. And especially because I, I was, it's very interesting because she's a homeopath and she's dermatologist homeopath. And uh, obviously, you know, she comes from a more like a traditional medicine path. But when I was uh, little, I, uh, when I was two years old, I started having uh, nervous tics quite strongly. 
and then around six years old I started a Tourette syndrome and I went into um, a kind of mild autism and she was desperate she really didn't know how to help me and her father was fat homeopathic using homeopathic and so she went to him and he told her the only way that I know you can help her is through homeopathy so through me she went back to that that she had put aside because she went to university and she was told different things so she was not interested in the medicine of her, of her dad so she brought me to this like really so she re she went back to school as a medical doctor. Well, uh, no, no, she she went back to homeopathy. Okay. Yeah, to you know, um, yeah, explore that because she had no other way to help me, and um, so she went to see like this really um, old um, doctor. Uh, he was I don't know by the time I think he was like about eighty years old. He looked really old and he looked really funny with his like very funny clothes and he had you know like uh, he was um, working in a place with like reduced head from the sh from the shuaras and fetus and just like it looked like really really strange and um, um, so she went there it was the best you know um, it was an absolute genius in homeopathy and he, um, very quick, quickly you know he started helping me and just uh, there was um, a big shift from that moment obviously it was a very long healing path but something really started to shift at that point and so she started to learn of him uh, first of all, you know, privately, and uh, and then you know, she slowly, slowly kind of um, went back to school for homeopathic school, and then eventually she went to India to study with an Indian homeopathic um, doctor, and um, to study a specific method of uh, of homeopathy, and that's her whole world right now, basically. So through that, um, it's very interesting because through my situation she had to look for something else and through looking for something else she opened up to different vision of things in the world and health and obviously she you know opened my world as well and so she came you know started talking about meditation reincarnation and all the things it's kind of you know the whole story that we were told at home where became like much more open and um so when I was um, when I was nineteen, finished school. I um, at that point, I just had this urge inside me to find my spiritual path, and that's the only thing that interested me. I had absolutely no interest in um, at that point, you know, career or I didn't really know, you know, what was you know for me to be doing. I just Obviously, art was very present. So I went to Nepal and um, pretended to go to study um, um, poetry, but really I knew that you know I wanted to just you know start to get to know meditation. So I went there, and then um, yeah, just met um, Osho community. So I became Osho disciple, started with meditation. I got married to an Indian man, like very young. Uh, so it was, it was, you know, my very well-built um, stage of life where I just, you know, um, decided at the point I was not going to study anything because um, I thought that um, the only true knowledge was the one that we could acquire, acquire, I can't do another word, um, through, you know, personal experience and inner search and, and I didn't believe at all in, you know, um, knowledge that you study and um, so also just kind of going there opened me up to yeah, just another uh, experience of life and just kind of realize that indeed you know the path that I was offered uh, as a you know Belgian girl um, Western world um, was definitely not the only one. That was not the only way to live, and then there were like many other point of view that were very valuable. And um, and then also seeing the situation of people in Nepal, I just started to feel like maybe art isn't exactly you know my proper path, and I would be willing to let go of that so that I can maybe do something which is more about helping people. At the point, I thought it was had something to do with social work or something. And um, 
anyway, went back to Belgium and um, um, I had a project, you know, with my ex-husband to work, um, you know, make clothes in India, sell them in Belgium. So I went to study uh, cloth designing for, to have, you know, the tools, the skills that I needed in order, to, in order to do that. And those three years that I went to school um, was really, really challenging for me because I felt like I was completely cut off from my uh, spiritual, spiritual search. And I was in a um, very deep depression. By then also I you know, split up with my ex-husband. And um, yeah, I just, I really prayed, you know, for a sign, something. You know, I just remember it was the first time I actually really prayed to the sky and said, you know, whatever is there, um, please just help me. And um, when I finished uh, study, I felt like, okay, I did my duty as a Western daughter. You know, I have a diploma and then you know, I'm really free to do whatever I want and explore. I feel like I, you know, I gave what I hold. And so I went to I went to England, um, really out of um, again you know really strong intuition that I had to go there. I actually enrolled on a um, breathwork course, but when I started, I didn't really know what it was about. I just knew that I had to do it. And so I um, went there, and that's where um, I met the, the medicine. I had heard about it. Um, a while ago about ayahuasca yeah, yeah. and um at that point because i was on a meditation path it wasn't the idea of medicine just really didn't fit together because you know the idea that you can reach consciousness through meditation why would you take a plan for that but i really had that curiosity about it so i thought i'm gonna try it once and see what happens and and so i had a lot of friends who were um on the on the red path um, and then so it's one day they just say, hey, you know, we're having a ceremony happening in Belgium. If you want to come. And I thought, wow, something called ceremony happening in Belgium. I'm definitely going because I was in Belgium. I felt so isolated, you know, from a spiritual community that it felt like, um, yeah, something I couldn't miss. So, and I went there and I, I just absolutely fell in love with it. I, it was the, the the beauty of the red path is behind the use of the medicine, you know, the whole um, ceremony and ritual, um, the the prayers, um, actually the medicine itself, and I was amazed by all the beauty and the medicine was priority and it was very gentle with me and I didn't really realize the effect of the medicine during that night. But I was just deeply touched by the the sound of the of the wind, you know, in the in the midnight prayer, the water prayer, you know, when they would just kind of you know bless the directions and the altars with the, the water and the wind, just that sound in the night and the and the prayers that they were putting in the water that was it felt like ours, just like pure poesy. And I remember in that moment I just look at a bucket of water that for me was really just a bucket of water. And I felt if I can see in that bucket of water what they see, I'm saved. And it was really deep understanding that, you know, that's something that I, I, I needed to open up within myself, that um, possibility to, to see spirit in, in, uh, in all things, really. And um, so, yeah you know, entered there and, and didn't leave for 13 years, basically. So I, I went um, deep into it straight away. I started Vision Quest, um, went to many more ceremonies, sweat lodges in Moscow. And um, yeah, I my drive was always to work with ayahuasca. It, it took many years for me to actually really get to ayahuasca because the, the path just somehow to me Peyote and then Ecuador, San Pedro, and I um, received a blessing to run uh, sweat lodges and then uh, and then medicine ceremonies, um, and and that's actually when I um, when I started to run ceremonies. That's when I realized that 
it was time for me to start going on dietas. Um, because I understood that, first of all, there was more things for me to heal. So if I wanted to do one that, um, in a way that I could be really a, a true medicine for my community. And, and also I knew that um, that path kind of mainly trained spiritual leaders and I wasn't really interested in that. I knew that my path was of healing and, uh, and the depth of healing that I really wanted to be able to um, bring to people. I knew that I wasn't going to run it in that school. And um, so I, I you know, came to Peru to, to diet. And I really didn't think at the point that it was going to lead me, you know, where I am now. I thought I could bring that to what I was actually doing. But somehow it just really aligned me to, yeah, where I was really meant to be. Mm -hmm. Can you speak a bit about the red path? Uh, I imagine some people have heard of that, but I, mm -hmm. I would imagine a lot of people haven't. Yeah, well, the the, the red path is um, actually is is um, traditions from North of America, so um, different tribes of America, um, I would say, go under you know that um, red path um, word even though they have, you know, they all have their different kind of ways. Um, and the specific tribe, I would say, that I was uh, walking with is a, actually a very modern one. Um, he was um, the, the chief of that path, um, trained with, with Lakotas. He, he, you know, he received initiations, he was adopted by Lakotas, and then he received the, uh, the permission to, to open a new path. So that specific path I was on um, holds the prayer of bringing together the people from the four directions uh, back around the same fire. So it, it really opened the, um, that altar, the medicine, the, the half moon altar to Western people, first of all, mestizos because mestizos didn't really have their space in, in, the, um, in the North American tribe because they are really protective of their, uh, their tradition. So it was, first of all, a space for mestizos to be able to come back around the fire and, and, and reconnect with their tradition and, um, and, and, and then Western people. So we, around the altar, we used um, different kind of medicines. Mm -hmm. And the people of the four directions, meaning like the, the native peoples of the four directions of North No, the, the four races uh, yeah. of the world. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's, it's a prayer of alliance, basically. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What is the history of that? It, it, it's a fairly modern thing, yeah? The, mm -hmm. That idea of, of bringing everyone together. And well, yes and no, because the... the um, um, I suppose you've heard of the prophecy of the eagle and the condor, which is pretty ancient. And uh, so it's that prayer of the path I was on, um, find its inspiration into, into that. So it was a, a vision that the, um, the chief had, um, you know, to be part of the fulfillment of that, um, the encounter of the... Um, you know, definitely of the knowledge, you know, held by the, the ego of the people of the north and the, and the condo of the people of the south. And it's also about the, <clears throat> the sun and the moon, you know, just kind of bringing back together those, those worlds, and the western and, and the eastern world, the, the physical, the mind world, and the spiritual world, just bringing, all, bringing it all back together. Mm -hmm. So then, uh, after that, you, you were saying you, you spent quite a long time in Ecuador working with, with Wachumi, with San mm -hmm. Pedro. Yeah. Can you speak a little bit about what that was like? Because mm. I haven't spoken so much, or I haven't had people speak so much about Wachuma a few times, but yeah. it seems like a medicine that, that a lot of people aren't familiar with, and yet it's, it's starting to become more known. Yes, and, and, and yes, I, I, yet I feel like um, 
um, I, I probably wouldn't be able to 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 give it the justice it deserves because, as you were mentioning the other day, it's um, the the old ways of working with Machuma Wachuma <coughs> are pretty much lost, um, and and so it's a lot of you know recuperation of, of work of recuperation of the memory. So. The way that I've worked with Wachuma was within the context of the um, of the half moon ceremony from the north, and um, but in the same time that you know I worked with peyote around that altar, and then when I actually for the first time went to Wichole ceremony, it was a completely other story. Um, but you know, in the in the experience that I have with that medicine in that context, it's. Um, it's an incredibly beautiful spirit um, um, of, of of love, really. Um, they they um, generally call it San Pedro, and uh, they they say that when the when the Catholic went to um, to South America to the Andes, and they they got to know that medicine, they call it San Pedro because they say that it, op it opens the door of the paradise. So it's it's a uh, it's a medicine that is. Um, why is a big, tall cactus that is going up towards the sky, and that's really what it does. It brings, uh, yeah, it just it's just open up to that spirit world, you know, going up. Um, and for me, it really connected me to. Um, yeah, to the sky and, and to the because also the prayer of the red path is is is, is very much about honoring great spirit and and um, and connecting and connecting and communicating with great spirit. Um, that medicine is 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 beautiful to be able to make that bridge with whatever is about. And also, obviously, within you know the above that is within. Mm -hmm. And how did you how did you end up in Ecuador working with with what you know? Well, I uh, I was on the first vision quest I did. Uh, it, it was really hard work. It was four days, uh, four days and four nights. Um, so without drinking, without. Um, Without eating, without speaking to anyone in the mountain, just with a blanket, um, and um, it, it was it was. Um, I felt like I was going mad. You know, I was basically I met the the madness that of my own head, basically, and 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 uh, and the sadness of my life at that point as well, because I. I wasn't yet on, you know, really in touch with my path, and that brought a lot of sadness in me because I, I, I didn't feel yet that I was having a sense of purpose or that I was f fulfilling my purpose, and I felt that my life was just really much about me, and uh, and that was really painful. And um, so, in that vision quest, I um, really understood that first of all, the, the the best way to give thanks for my life, you know, because when you're in a vision quest, you are not eating and you you are not drinking, you are kind of in the process of dying, you know, and uh, and as you die, you just you know realize the value of life. And then I understood that the best way for me to give thanks to my life was to um, live my life in, in the most beautiful way and, 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 and create beauty and, 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 and really fulfill you know, that purpose and, 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 uh, and find a way to share what I had within, you know, what I had to share and find what it is that I had to share really. And, um, and so in that moment, I just, um, I realized that it was absolutely fundamental for me to um, um, make the change that I had to make in order to really walk um, on that path. So I felt that it would be necessary for me to 
um, go and made a tradition um, at the root. Um, the vision course was led by an um, um, Ecuadorian um, medicine woman, chief, Carmen Vicente. And so the next year I went back on the second vision quest and, uh, and then I, I just kind of went deeper into that, into the prayer, into the call. And um, also in that vision quest, I realized that all my prayers had been answered, you know, that day that I just kind of, you know, called for help to the sky and I just suddenly realized, well, actually I'm here with a tobacco in my hand in front of a fire praying for my life. I'm here, I'm connected to whatever it is that I called for. And so I put that prayer <clears throat> to be led to where I had to go. And as I finished the vision quest, came down the, in the closing ceremony, she made an invitation, the, the chief, to um, to go to Ecuador, to um, the first woman gathering that she was organizing with indigenous women, medicine women of, of the you know, different part of the world, part of that uh, tradition, and, and also more like um, um, traditional uh, ways of Ecuador. And so I got I'm going, you know, there was just no question about that. So I went um, for 17 days first. And um, yeah, it was it was just absolutely amazing, you know, being in that space. And, and then I, I, I got a very clear um, call to go back and drink as much, as much medicine as I could. It really felt that it was, you know, the, the, the word of the earth. Um, so I did that. I, I you know, went back to England and uh, just five months organized myself so that I could go for a year. And what I knew was Ecuador. Um, first I went to the States with her again for another um, women gathering and then I went to Ecuador. And um, yeah, and, and there I just connected with the few people that I had known. And my intention was always to go to Peru, uh, to the Amazon, to drink ayahuasca, but that it's like everywhere I went, the people that would normally work with ayahuasca had run out of ayahuasca, and they just had San Pedro, so I just worked with San Pedro. And then I met um, a medicine man uh, from Ecuador, who is very specifically San Pedro, from the tradition as well, from the Red Path tradition, and um, bringing together the Red Path and the, um, the ceremonies from the Quechua, so old Quechua that lived in the in the foot of, uh, of a volcano over there. And so I fell in love with his work. Um, and I it was it was beautiful what he was creating and, and um, I stayed there. So what was what was that process like of, of during that time of working with, with San Pedro? You you, you you lived with with them and you were just doing ceremonies or yeah the, the first year um, he, he, he lived he, I mean he had a house in, uh, in in Ibarra which is a small town in the in, in Babura. Um, like it's like in the, uh, high in the Andes and um, I, he had he had a house there and there were just few people um, in Ecuador at that time and and we mainly stayed in his, in his house. Obviously, you know, we just kind of go different places. But yeah, I was staying there in his house and we would do, you know, small ceremonies. It was beautiful because it was really a time where we had a lot of opportunity to do very intimate ceremonies. So we would do like in the kitchen, we would just um, work together. And, and, uh, and yeah, so I became a student, one of his students. And um, we did quite, um, yeah, I think I've been working with him for around 10 years um, and then um, eventually he, he started to go to Europe and more and more to Europe and then so when I went back to Europe so I just um, you know accompanied in the work in Europe as well and then he eventually opened the vision quest in, in, in Italy so I was um, for I think the four first year I was part of the team that um, lifted up that, that vision quest over there. Um, yeah, I was taking care of the altars there. So, yeah, been, you know, in many adventures uh, within that group for, yeah, about 10 years. 
and yet you know just kind of um, also working for the people mainly with him um, the chief of Ecuador um, who is my godfather in that path also taught me uh, a lot and mainly learned to work with the Mascal with him uh, the, the beauty in, in, in Ecuador is that it's uh, there's so many um, so many people doing the work that we could literally go to one Temascal a day, you know, in different places where they had Temascal. And so I mainly, I was mainly going to um, um, that one. And so once a week I would go and started to learn working on the fire. And um, yeah, just basically learned everything that I could. <laughs> mm -hmm. How would you describe that medicine of, of Tamas Kali? Mm. For me, the Tamas Kali is, the, is my absolute favorite place on earth. Um, it's, it's the place that where I, um, I find it the easiest and the sweetest um, to connect with the earth. So it's being in that in that warm, warm in the in, in the darkness and, and the yeah just the the, the, the sweetness and, 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 and the love of the earth and all the elements is is um, very for me really accessible in that place and again it's working with the prayer so just it's, it's a, the, you know we're working with the medicine wheels of the four directions and the four elements so every round is a prayer to a different element, and um, the songs, you know, are prayer to different element, and it's it's um, it's a journey into also the 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 cycle of the human being, you know, from uh, birth to infants, to adolescence, to adulthood, to um, older age and death. So it's kind of this complete circle. So it's really a, a beautiful place to explore the old path of being a human being and, 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 and remembering the um, um, yeah the teachings of the of the elders which are you know the air, the water, the fire and the earth. Mm. So from from that experience you had said you, you had always wanted to come to the Amazon. What was the what was the catalyst that eventually led you to, to leave Ecuador and, and come to the jungle? Um, well, I actually left Ecuador without really knowing that I was leaving. Um, I think I was I was still kind of not sure about where my place was, and. You know, very practical things. So I had run out of every idea that I could find to just extend my visa. So that it was definitely one thing. Um, so I had the intention to come back to Belgium for a while and do some work with, with that medicine man in, in, in Europe. Um, but it was it was a lot of um, thing going on for me at the time. Also, I, I realized that you know my parents were not getting any younger, and uh, I re felt like I had to make a choice about you know do I settle here in America and just, you know, make my life and possibly, you know, make a family here. But that means going farther and farther away from the possibility to accompany my, my family and, and have them in my life as well. Because the the, the prayer of the, the Red Path, obviously, is, is very much about um, our relations. And the family is very important. And uh, so it was very in the center. It really helped me, you know, that prayer really helped me to um, to come back to a, a place of uh, uh, love and desire to bring harmony in, in uh, and, and really reconnect in a beautiful way with my uh, with my relations and first of all my family relations. So I really felt that it was it was calling me, you know, that I had to I had to go back. Um, to my family so but I went back and didn't really know um, that I was going to stay you know I was going back for three months and I ended up you know staying there um, yeah. 
and so forth. Yeah. So, what was that? Where did you find that kind of balance between being in Europe, being close to your family, and then also deciding to, to come back to, to South America and, and begin guiding mm. and working with ayahuasca? Well, I, I stayed a few years in, in, uh, in Europe um, without coming back to, to South America. And actually, when I went back to Europe, that's when ayahuasca actually came my way. Uh, with a medicine woman from Ecuador who lives in in uh, um, in, in Germany, Pilar Ortega, and I, I met her through Claude um, because he was working with her and with, with another medicine man, and so I, I went to one of the, their retreat, and that's really where I started to find the balance that I needed between that you know, masculine energy of the San Pedro and the feminine. And that's where it's like I I healed a lot of things and I learned a lot of things within that, you know, red path with that medicine of San Pedro, Aguacoya, Wachuma. But I felt that I had come to a place where I was not going any farther. There were things that were not really moving within me and I was kind of banging my head on the same wall. And starting working with ayahuasca really helped me to go beyond that place. Um, definitely bring brought um, a lot of softness within me that I was definitely lacking. Uh, more flexibility, um, which is kind of started to dissolve the very hard structure and discipline, you know, but in a in in a hard way that I had, you know, built around myself. And um, and also it started to dissolve, you know, all the spiritual ego that I had created, you know, within that path, because it's very much a part of, you know, creating leaders and being leaders and and, uh, and somehow um, you know, one can get lost in that. And and so that really just kind of started to dissolve all of that. And I felt like I really needed the balance of both. And um, and then when, when I got, you know, the... the actually, I had gotten to a place where I had decided not to ask the blessings to run ceremonies because I realized that it was a big responsibility and and I thought that I was it was a good place for me to help. And just when I made the decision after wondering about it for a, quite a long time, my teacher just came to me and he said, so when are you going to ask for the blessings? What are you waiting for? And so I just you know, went back into that, that questions, and so I decided to go back to Ecuador to do a sentence and um, you know, pray for that and, and ask permission and, and to come to clarity for myself uh, about whether or not to ask for the, for the blessings. So I went, um, I did my dance, and, uh, and, then, and then I did ask for the blessings. And, and so I started the work. And as I said earlier on, that's when I realized that um, I had quite a bit more work to do on myself. And, and so, because when I came to Ecuador first, I heard about the Guerras, and I knew the time, so that was 10 years before that, I knew that um, I would do it eventually. But as for everything, I was waiting for the clear call for it. So when I started running um, medicine ceremony that I felt like, okay, that's the time for me to do that. And it just so happened that Claude was um, starting to bring Maestra Ines and Maestra Laura and eventually, eventually Maestra Lila in, um, in Europe. And so I thought, okay, you know, I, I know Claude, I trust him. And because I'm looking for a place to go and buy it, um, first of all, I'm going to go and change those people. And I went to that <clears throat> first ceremony with my Ines and my Sadora, and I was blown away. I just woke up 
at the end of the ceremony and I was like, I don't know what I've done for the last 10 years. It felt like it was the first time ever I was drinking medicine. And I felt during the whole night, like if I was <clears throat> swimming into the ocean of the love, the mother universe. And I was so held and so cared for um, while I was touching a very, very deep trauma that I hadn't been able to you know, access before that because I was really scared. And, um, and so I thought, okay, I'm not going to look any farther. This is my place. These people are the people I want to work with. So then I, again, organized myself a few months after I went to, I came to Pucallpa and, and uh, did my first year I was done. Mm. You, you described uh, Wachuma as, as having more of this, this masculine energy or quality, and, and I think you were referencing ayahuasca when you said more of this feminine, and it's, it's a fairly common archetype that, that is said. Why, why for you do those plants embody those, those energies? I, I, I don't know if I can I can say why it just you know it just it's just an experience you know just as when I'm in front of you just like I experience man energy can I really describe it you know fully I don't know but it's just you know when I see you coming I'm not wondering whether you're a man or woman I just like you feel like a man um, so but maybe, um, maybe it has to do with um, the experience of San Pedro Wachuma um, connecting, by just connecting me to spirit, you know, to a higher place, which is not material while um, ayahuasca, at least definitely in the Chipibo way, um, really brings me back down to the body and, and to this reality. Obviously, spirit is very present there, but in a very um, kind of more tangible way, maybe, I would say. And um, yeah, it just, I, I know that different traditions working with ayahuasca, you know, have um, a relation to either the feminine spirit of ayahuasca or the masculine spirit of ayahuasca. You know, for instance, coffins, cof, coffin, sorry, uh, coffins, sorry. <laughs> uh, uh, you know, as I understand more working with the um, masculine spirit of ayahuasca, I, I don't have much experience with them. I only did two ceremonies of them. Not enough for me to be able to... Um, um, sense, you know, that um, difference, I would say. Um, but yeah, in, in my in my experience, uh, ayahuasca has always felt feminine, and, and uh, San Pedro has always felt masculine. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you mentioned Ines, Laura, and Lila, which uh, they're they're all one family. Ines being the mother, and then uh, Laura and Lila being her daughters. Um, so from from there, you decided to come and and begin working with them, begin doing ceremony or dieting with them. Yes, I I did it first uh, uh, two weeks. Um, uh, Master Candiera with uh, um, Ines, Laura, and Lila, my Ines, Laura, and Lila. And um, I remember, like, really, as I started, Claude telling me, you know, if you are walking, working with medicine, it would be really important for you to dedicate yourself to Diera. Yeah. And uh, at that time, I didn't have the understanding of, you know, why the Eda is just so fundamental um, in order to really understand the medicine and really understand how to work with it. And um, so I could hear what he was saying, but um, I, I was on another path. You know, I was doing 
and thing else and i had responsibility and so on you know within my communities and, and i just didn't feel like i had the space time or even the money to just kind of really go for a month and and uh, and, and work with the medicine so um i did those two weeks and uh but then i clearly felt that i had you know to come again i really feel when i did the two weeks i i I really believe that, you know, it was going to change my world, you know, and that in two weeks I was going to heal and learn and everything to come together um, because I had such a, you know, immense faith in the, in the medicine. Um, but then I was, you know, I just came to understand that I, like everything is a process and it takes time and it takes dedication. And, um, but that first year um, really helped me to um, untangle all the, the energetical, you know, nuts I was, I was in and helped me to come to a very clear decision about um, um, leaving, you know, um, partly the, at least how involved I was, you know, within the, the, the spiritual community I was in with the work. And, and slowly, slowly that, you know, get us to help me to free myself from whatever wasn't, um, you know, right for me in order to walk my path. And, and, and within that process, I, you know, I came back to another, uh, another year that and I did one month and then, and then next year I came back and I did another, another month. And even during the beginning, it was not super easy to, to really, you know, sense like, deep changes but it's like now when i look back and i see all the way that i have done all the work that i've done since is absolutely immense uh but it's 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 the beauty of it is that it doesn't um turn you into someone else from one day to the other you know because it's like everything we you know things needs to grow you know and it probably would be just far too traumatic to just transform in one day so it's something that just kind of really takes, it took this, this time and, and, and just, it's like it prepared myself to be able to make decision in a soft way, uh, where the decision just kind of made themselves. I didn't really have to think too much about it. Just like, you know, I just, I just walked, I just walked it and here I am. And um, so I did first um, three months, I mean, three, um, three dieras with Maestra Lila Laura and Ines. And as it wasn't premeditated, but now as I understand it is, you know, at least, you know, from um, Jose's teaching, is Maestro Jose's teaching, is um, um, dieras goes in three. It's good to do three dieras. And so without knowing, that, knowing it, I actually did a cycle of three eating dieras. And then by the end of the um, of the three, actually w during the last one, I I really had um, yeah the strong call to do a longer dieta. And I had met Maestro Jose um, at Maestra Ines' center in Iguarao Shobo, and um, I had you know felt um, pretty pretty soon a clear connection with him and I, I knew that there was a path to walk there uh, with him and um, yeah just you know at some point realized that he was a teacher that I had always been looking for um, and and then when I felt the call to do longer dieta and and to start learning that's when he was opening Shipi uh, Warao's center and, and so next the year after I went and started dieting with him. You, you mentioned at a point you realized the, the importance of, of the dieta. Why, why do you think the dieta is, is so important? Something that maybe you hadn't found in any other ways you were working. Um, there's probably many things to say about that. Um, I think the main thing is is the um, hmm, give me a moment. Is 
obviously I can only speak about the Shipi Bopa, you know, because that's what I know. And uh, the Shipi have such an incredible depth of knowledge and mastery of what they do, which comes from dietary master plans. Because the true teachers and the true healers are master plans. Um, as they as they say, um, in a very simplified way, ayahuasca doesn't heal anything. What actually heals are the master plans. And not to say that ayahuasca doesn't really heal anything. Obviously, you know, ayahuasca does does its work on a certain level, not on all levels, and uh, and also. Uh, an image that they like to use is, is like working with ayahuasca is like mourning the grass. So somehow we can, um, you know, control a situation, but master plans take it from the root. And so the master plans bring, um, really bring the strength and, uh, and, and, and the power of healing and the knowledge and bring an understanding to that work which is uh, profound and so when I was working with medicine plans before without that the master plan I had in comparison I can see now that I had a very um, superficial understanding of the medicine world and and why now i can still say that i have pretty superficial understanding of it because like obviously you know every time the more we you know we walk the more we learn the more we realize that there's so much more um but it's like i'm i feel like i'm on on on, on another side of the spectrum that um I, did, I didn't have that, that vision and the, the understanding back then. Mm -hmm. What would you say are the important qualities of a dieta? Because again, I think probably a lot of people are maybe familiar with it. Maybe they haven't done one. They've maybe heard of it or they're familiar with the idea. But for you, what do you think is, is fundamental or very important like qualities or characteristics that a, that a dieta should have? Mm. Can you just, I, ha I have something, but can you just go a bit more in that question just to make sure that I'm having it right? For example, uh, I mean, I guess one in a general sense, just speaking about the dieta, what, what it entails. Because again, the, I think even even when we use a word, there can be a lot of meanings of what people are actually saying when they're referring to that. Even for example, like often I, I use analogies of martial arts, and there can be a lot of people who say, "Oh, well, I do martial arts." But do you really do martial arts? Mm -hmm. There's a very big difference. For example, if you put a, I don't know, someone who nothing wrong with karate, but someone who practices karate once a week. Kind of as an exercise, <laughs> and someone who's doing jujitsu six times a week. Mm -hmm. There's just there's a very different quality to, to what that practice is. They're both martial arts, mm -hmm. um, but there, there's there's qualities that that allow one to go very deep into that martial art. Things like discipline, regular practice, having a really good teacher, having other good people who are around you who can help to push you past your mm -hmm. limits, uh, doing other things like exercising, practice, mm -hmm. repetition, uh, really having faith in the practice. You know, all of these things mm -hmm. are going to make a difference. Mm -hmm. So maybe in that way, like, what do you think is important in a dieta? Mm -hmm. Like, is it important to be in isolation? Is talking important? Is working mm -hmm. with someone who 
has done that work themselves in Portland. Is there a benefit to working with certain plants rather than other plants? Mm -hmm. is, is there a difference if you do a dieta for three days versus three months? Mm -hmm. um, kind of, it, it's it's a bit, um, somehow it's a bit difficult to answer to that question because there are so many ways to do dietas. And um, it's like every maestro and maestra have their different ways. And so it's like when I started working with dieta, I just, I, I thought that what I was doing was kind of the only way and I thought that all the other ways were just like not, you know, proper. But actually the more I, I you know, uh, walk with that, with the path, I, I, I realized that um, there, are, there are as many ways as there are maestros. And even um, there are as many ways as there are type, types of dieta as well, because you have healing dietas, you have alignment dietas, you have learning dietas and they have different kind of requirements and uh, they definitely, you know, and there are dietas given to Western people and there are dietas given to um, um, indigenous people or to Peruvian people because we have different mind, you know, we have different story, we have different kind of situation that we come to work with. So even like um, you know, the, the, the dietas that I'm, I'm, I'm receiving um, now on this path of learning um, still, you know, are very, very much adapted to the fact that I'm a Western woman um, because I have to be prepared, you know, for that. And uh, and Maestro Jose is is uh, has been, you know, leading me um, deeper and deeper into a traditional way of of uh, working with data. Um, and and yet I wish to go even deeper. But is is really guiding me, you know, according to how ready I am to, you know, take on different certain kind of things. So um, I think that definitely, you know, something that is is valuable for every maestro, every maestro, every cleanse, and every dieter is yeah, trust and faith. You know, is um, first of all um, finding someone to work with that. Um, really awaken, awakens that, um, that trust and that faith. It's very important in this kind of work um, because it's so powerful to, to be working with someone that you can sense the, through the nature of the heart and the intention. Um, and someone that has a, you know, right put in the right, the heart put in the right place is going to be a good guide um, that will, you know, take care of you. And, uh, and, and definitely, you know, trust and faith in, one, in oneself more than anything and, and in the process and, uh, and in the plans. And, and as they say, you know, it's like, Trust and faith really means patience as well. So it's being able to be patient with the process. And, and um, um, as Western people, we we are used for things to be really instantaneous. Um, you know, we're so used to work with pills. You know, to uh, remove a headache or um, um, you know things to be turned on just by pushing on a button and uh, and so we kind of um, we kind of lost the um, rhythm you know of, of letting things happen in the right in the right timing and one thing that is very very important is um, the, the work of the mind um, and that obviously you know really enters in that um, trust and faith is is uh, it's like, as they say, it's like having one line of thought, um, which is where we want to be. So entering in a dieta, or even entering in a medicine ceremony, whether it's with master plant or not, is, uh, they say, like the moment that you drink the glass, you need to have one line of thought and stay there. That's how the purification comes. Because it's like within a dieta or within the medicine ceremonies will... Here, um, 
the energies that we actually want to hear and we, we want to get free from. Whether it's a thought pattern, or whether it's an emotion, whether it's an energy, whether there are the things that come, you know, from past generation and so on, a trauma, a fear, um, and if we maintain our attention on the place where we want to be, then we stop feeding all of things, and then we allow the, the plan to work. And that's something that is really important is that to surrender, surrender to the to the plan, surrender to the to the work. Um, we we often tend to think that we have we have to work, we have to do something. And what I what I personally came to understand is that. I don't actually have to do much. My part of the work is to focus my attention where I want to be. The plants are the ones that are working. And I don't need to understand what they are doing. I don't need to, um, I don't even need to know what they are healing. I don't even know, need to know what traumas I had or, you know, what what traumas created the, the feeling that I'm having or, or the situation I'm in. Um, what matters is that that's been healed. Mm -hmm. I had um, um, a teacher that um, when I was in, under, uh, you know, walking the right path and, and uh, some Wachuma, um, when he was doing um, Kichwa ceremonies from, from the Andes that were um, ceremonies that were using um, we were using different kind of things, you know, to cleanse ourselves before the ceremony. And the first thing that it would give us a, a candle, and we had to, you know, cleanse like if we were um, using a soap. And so he would lit the candle and read the flame. And and so he would just, you know, take a moment to read it, and he would always ask, after a while, do you want to know what I'm seeing in the flame? And obviously the people who were there for the first time would always say yes. And you say, well, you have to choose. Either I heal you or I tell you what you have. I can't do both. And um, it's like when we, when we try to work too much, when we try to understand too much, is first of all, we interfere in the world because it's like, we don't know any better than the plants, you know. We've been trying, you know, like for hours so long to sort ourselves out and we haven't been able to, so that's why we come to the plant. So let the plant do the work. Um, and and by trying to figure things out with the mind, we are holding on to the things and it's harder for the plant to do the work. Um, trust and faith, so in the sense that whenever we we doubt whether we doubt ourselves or we doubt the process or we doubt the plans, they, they tend to go away. Um, you know, if, you, if I come to you and to ask you to help me with something you're good at and, and I constantly doubt, you know, whether you're going to be able to help me with that, at some point you're going to get bored and you're just going to say, well, you know, whatever. I'm, going somewhere else um the plants are like that you know and 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 somehow they have maybe a bit less patience and you know that you would have with me um because they are not from the human world so they have a different um it's, it's difficult to even just kind of use words that are you know human related but i say that we they may have, they may have a little different quality of tolerance and of patience, um, and it's like when we it's like when we enter into the heart of the plant, it's really it's really good to understand that we really we enter into their house. They are the queen of the house. They make the rules, and what they have to share healing and teaching is so incredibly valuable. It's sacred 
to a level that is 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 very difficult to grasp and to understand. It's like we are really entering into the world of the spirit. And the same thing, you know, and especially, I think especially for Western people, because we come from such a history of we go somewhere, we want something, and we take it. You know, the same way that, that we have done when we came here, you know, with the gold and with all the resources, and the same the same we do with the, with the uh, with spirit, with the knowledge, and with the medicine. So when we when we enter into that house, um, it's it helps to you know remember that we don't know nothing, you know, and that and that we are entering into a world that we really don't understand, and it's just kind of entering with the necessary humility, humility to you know follow rules that sometimes we might not even understand. It might not make sense, but it doesn't have to make sense. We don't have to understand it because we don't have to agree or disagree. It's just the way it is. So it's like as you were going to a um, old wise, you know, hermit in the, in the mountain, in the Himalaya, you know, it's, um, it's the way they say, you know, and that's the discipline that is required from someone that wants to learn. And whether we want to eat or we want to learn, it's always a learning. So it's like whenever we enter into that house, as they say, it's like the maestros and the maestras are there to help. And they, they are like our lawyers. So it's like they have a relation with the plants. And then when we, they give us a dieta, first of all, they have a conversation with the plants and they ask the permission to... Um, to open the data for us and they to, we talk on behalf of us they make themselves responsible for us and and so if um if we make a mistake they are the first one that will be told of by the plant um so it's all that relation of yeah, humility and acknowledging that we just really, really don't know anything, and uh, and surrendering, you know, fully to that world, you know, that we that that, that we understand. Um, Can you speak a bit more, I don't know if I remember the exact word or phrase you used, but this idea of having like one line of thought. Mm -hmm. You spoke a bit about it. Yeah. Is there anything else you can say about that? Can you, can you dig a bit into the question for me to see okay. what, what is that? I... You, you mentioned the, uh, kind of when we drink, starting from when we drink the medicine, yeah. like really having this one line of thought. Mm -hmm. and, uh, almost like as an anchor, or I think you also use the word intention. Because obviously a lot of things can come up. So why is that important for you to have, to have one line of thought? And, and, and really maybe even more like, what does that mean to you to have one line of thought? Mm. It's it's like if I if I'm if I'm standing on an equis, an equis that would be the right word to use, like um, in French is an axe. Axis. Axis, yeah. Um, which is that fault? Which is let's say, I'm the light of the universe, or I love myself, or I trust myself, or I'm love and light. Whatever um, thought that is aligned with where I want to be, you know, 
because that's where I want to be, definitely. You know, um, I'm the light of the universe is is a very um, it's a very cool thought. You know, because when we drink medicine, when we go for healing, what are we really looking for? We are looking for healing and clearing all that obscurity that is the trauma, the fear, the anger, um, the confusion, you know, depression, all of that, so that we can come back into that place of, of um, light, which we are, you know, the place of the, like the true essence of who we are, which is light and love. So if I can focus on that, you know, line of thought. And it's like, it's almost it's like the, you know, like the medicine are sharing, you know, the, the plants are sharing the medicine on us. And then everything which is not that can go away. But if I think, you know, if I, the energy of fear comes and I'm just kind of going there, you know, so I'm leaving that one line of thought then actually I'm not letting it go, you know, and it's, it's, it's actually, I'm feeding that. And then I bring that back into my center of light. So it's like when, um, you know, when we break bone, um, if, we, if we put a plaster around it, we actually give to the bone the shape that we want it to have. It's just kind of reminding the bone, you know, what it's, kind of what is the, the shape it has when it's healed and so that it can heal properly. But if I just, you know, if I leave it crooked, then it's going to live in that direction. So if I'm, if I'm putting attention to the things that I want to heal, then basically, you know, it's the, the, the work is going to be done in that direction. So if I'm in a ceremony and then I um, give in to fear, it would be harder for the fear to heal. And um, so it's, it's, you know, whether it's in a ceremony or it's during the day of the master plan or even the night when there is no ceremony with the master plan, that is just really working with the thoughts. Um, you know, positive thinking, as you might want to call it. And, and, then, um, and, and obviously that, can create some resistances as well. Um, you know, sometimes we have people saying, oh, you know, I don't want to work with positive thinking because, um, you know, I don't believe in that or whatever. But it's, it doesn't matter because it's not about, it's not about um, replacing something by, by other, another thing. It, it's just giving a direction. So the moment that we can give a direction to a thought, then the medicine knows, you know, what is our intention and where we, are, we want to work. But if I give my intention to my fear, then that's obviously, you know, that's what I'm gonna, you know, I'm, I'm gonna keep on creating. And why we do that, then the medicine does all this, you know, surgeries and, and all this work that I have no idea what it is that they are doing, but that's their thing, that's their job. Mm -hmm. What is that balance for you? You, you use this word like this idea of surrender, trust, faith. So that to me, on the one hand, seems like this, this letting go, almost this like archetypal feminine quality, like receiving. And then you also use this idea of like having one clear line of thought, which also in a way seems like a doing, that there's a coming back to something, maybe more of that masculine, that, that centeredness. And uh, so on the one hand, there's this, there's this letting go, this surrendering. And then also, I, I've heard uh, many people use this word of like dominar, like mm -hmm. you have to like master the energy of, of the mariación, of the effect of the plant. So what for you is that balance between on the one hand, even maybe like that example you used, because in it, in one sense, like on the extreme, that idea of surrendering would be, well, my bone is crooked, it's crooked. But then there's also an act of putting that cast on and bringing it back into alignment. And, and then there's maybe a surrender of, of 
once now I know that that cast is is good it's strong now there's a surrendering to to allow that to heal and even it, I think it's a very common thing many people have this question of, of this idea of this balance between sitting up and laying down like sitting up being being active being present there's almost a doing versus laying down and just allowing the medicine to to do whatever it needs to do well i i think it's a dance really you know and it's 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 good to explore both of them and it's interesting that you're using you know that example of sitting up and laying down um um in in, in my personal experience um as I was telling you earlier around, there used to be a time where I was really, you know, just um, hard and just not really flexible. And, and, you know, I was just, you know, I was holding myself because I had this will, you know, this very strong will, but it would, there was nothing soft about it. So I would always be sitting up in all ceremonies, you know, I would always be sitting up in Tamaskar, so, you know, always just strong, you know. But deep down, I was very, very vulnerable and, and, and uh, very fragile. And, uh, and so, and actually that's what, you know, I started to learn with ayahuasca was to allow myself to let down. So first I had to surrender fully. And then from the place of surrendering that I could slowly find back, um, um, a center or strength or discipline that that was much softer, that was much more loving, that was strong, but that wasn't hard. Um, so, and even with the thoughts, it's like when I'm when I'm in a dieta, or every day really, but this is specifically when I'm in a master plan dieta because that requires constant attention. I have to constantly explore many different kind of ways, you know, even one thought, you know, maybe, you know, what I what I like to call tricks, you know, just like the, the tricks that, you know, I use to maintain my attention where, where I want it to be um, in the moment that I need it. One trick may work one day, but it's not going to work the other day. You know, an example that I like to use is um, I used to have... Um, 17 mouse, mouses in my flat. Um, first I had one and it was in the kitchen and I thought, you know, cute little mouse, doesn't seem like it's eating anything. So I just had a conversation with that mouse and I really just, somehow in my innocence, you know, in love for life, whatever, you're just kind of really just believed or wanted to believe that she understood me and we had a really clear command understanding. You know, you stay in the kitchen, you don't eat anything and then I leave you in peace. And uh, and obviously, you know, soon after, I just realized that, you know, when you have one mouse, mouse you have plenty, you know, they make baby very quick. And uh, so I ended up with, you know, like a bunch of mouses in my in my flat. And then I had to look for a different way because I really didn't want to kill them. So I had to, you know, invent a trap so that I could just, you know, take it out of the house. And every time I would use one trap, in one way or another, it would work only once. It's like that mouse would just pass on the message, don't go there, you know, danger. Even in the end, you know, I had to use traps to kill them and they still, you know, would somehow pass on the message. And um, so it's really like the way thoughts work. It's like when you have one thought that is not desirable, if you don't take care of it straight away, you know, that thought is going to make babies. And uh, and then one trick is going to work one day. It's not going to work the other day. So it's really having to be, you know, playing with it. And uh, and that's where, you know, obviously the master plan really helps. You know, I can give um, some of the tricks that I have been using. But first I was given one. You know, and then and then I started playing around with that one, and then first of all, you know, with thought, I just realized, okay, well, it's not just about thinking it; it's about bringing life to it. You know, it has to 
become a feeling and how do I make it become a feeling? Well, first I'm going to say it out loud and, and oh, I'm going to give an intonation to it. Oh, I'm going to sing it. Oh, what about I dance it? Or I draw it. Or I, you know, play it. Um, so it's, 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 you know, really playing with it and, and, and maintaining the communication of the plant. So just kind of remembering that um, we have teacher inside, you know, when we do a master plan, basically what happens is that they are planting the energetical seeds of, of the plant, you know, the spiritual seed of the plant, and, and it's actually growing inside. So once we do a master plan, you know, that tree or that plant is going to be within us forever. Um, so it's about reaching out to that plant as well and uh, and and whatever difficulties we are facing is being able to say hey i'm noticing that my arm is crooked you know help me to find a way so that i can heal it and align it so it's noticing those things and then instead of just kind of getting lost into it or, or you know i just hate myself or I'm afraid or you know I'm, I can't do it or I will never be able to heal it's just talking the plan and saying you know I'm struggling here you know that's that's what I'm feeling that's the story of my I mean I see it help me to find a way out teach me and then being patient because the answer is not going to come straight away obviously you know first of all because um It's a, it's a learning process to, um, and it's like a relation, it's a connection that is being created, you know, it's just like I meet you and then you're not going to be my super friends straight away, it's going to take some time, you know, we have to kind of get to know each other, kind of really understand, you know, how do you, you know, how do you communicate, you know, just like, what's the, you know, what, how do you like to communicate, you know, and, and um, so it's, it's, uh, it's learning to, listen to the language of the plant which has no words and we are so used obviously to communicate with words and with thoughts is we have to open up to another way of communicating and the same with the heart you know it's like this wanting to to learn to be more in touch with the heart and listen to a heart is also a new path that needs to be opened because the heart speaks another language than the mind and uh, and it takes some time to um, start trusting the heart because first of all it's, maybe it's not going to answer straight away while the mind is just like really quick you know so if the heart doesn't give the answer straight away or if we are not able to listen or understand the answer whether or, or the heart or the plant then the mind just kind of you know takes over because the mind wants a quick answer and and so it's just you know being patient with that process and and that maybe it's going to come later on during the day or next day maybe in two weeks maybe in three months but it will come in the, earlier on you were you were saying that one of the the things that you really felt with the Shipibo that, that separated them, that they gave them a lot of this knowledge, is that they they were working with master plans. How would you how would you define master plans? How is a master plant different from from all of the other the numerous plants that that potentially could be worked with or even worked with as medicine? What 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 is that for you, that, that idea of a master plan? I mean, first of all, I, I, I don't have a, a um, deep enough personal knowledge of it that I can like fully answer that question. But, um, you know, from the little bit of experience that I have, of the little bit of relation that I have with the, with the master plans and, and, and ayahuasca, for instance, or the plans, and also from what I hear, uh, it doesn't seem that there is like one clear answer. Um, for instance, some maestro says all plants are master plants, and some others say they are not. 
um, you know, those who say they are not, they say, you know, there are a lot of medicinal plants and everything is med potentially medicinal plants, even the poisonous one depends on, on the, the, the quantity or the, that we use, um, but not all plants are master plants. Um, so I don't know the exact answer to that, um, but in my understanding or experience of what I would call a master plant, um, you know, as we said earlier on, they are, they are healers, they are teachers, and they are protectors. And yet you can take a master plan as a medicinal remedy, and you can take it as a master plan. It depends on the intention that is being put there. It depends on the, on the ikaro that is being put there. Um, personally, I, I, I'm not in a place yet that I would know how to open a, a, a diet, you know, even for myself. I, I don't know the Icaros. I don't know, I don't know, I, I don't know the protocol, you know, the, the secret protocol, because everything is very secret in that world, you know, they don't say much. Sometimes they may seem like they say much, but they don't actually, you know, say much, and they don't like Christians very much either. Uh, that's also a good thing, you know, that I just uh, have learned along the way. And I still make far too many questions for this test, you know, especially talking about my maestro, maestro Jose. Um, and, um, but yeah, so it's, it's, uh, it's a plan that, um, first of all, is the process of relating to it within the context of the tierra that, you know, allows us to um, um, access that gift that they, that they are bringing. And, uh, and then is the, is, is the quality of the, um, you know, of the plant, the teaching that it brings. Mm. You also mentioned this idea um, between the, the there are certain diets that are more for healing, certain ones that may be more for aligning, certain ones that are for learning. Can you speak a bit about, to you or for what you've learned, what those what those differences are? Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Well, in, in 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 my process, it was definitely starting with uh, with with healing, and obviously when you do healing the other day, is an element of alignment, you know, definitely important, and then there's a, an element of, of learning. Um, the healing the others obviously are very personal, we are the healing for oneself, you know, for the medicine to heal our body, our mind, our spirit, our life, you know, our relations, um, because obviously it affects our soul, or it has effect. On, the, on, on our relations and uh, the, there's always alignment you know in the during but specifically in the end of a healing data because after you heal you need to align you know uh, you need to give strength to it and and then for me after I did those main healing dietas, then I did a long alignment dietas, and obviously they were healing in that, um, but it was really to prepare me for being able to, to come, you know, to start learning. And, um, and as they say, learning dietas, apprenticeship dietas, we, we don't diet for ourselves, we diet for our for other, they say you can't, you can't heal and learn in the same time. It's like it's one or the other. So, this is a big question, but how would you describe the the, the process with which you've seen the Shipibo are working? If if someone is is kind of new to this work, but they they have this. This maybe desire to come and work with Shipibo or work with the Dieta, work in ceremonies. Th through that experience of the Shipibo, how would you say they're they're going about working? There's like there's a diagnosis, there's a there's a prescription, there's there's ceremony. 
what for you is happening in that ceremony where what are these songs where are they coming from what are they trying to do uh, why is coming for a certain amount of time important what, what is that idea like of alignment what is that idea of integration I mean I know it's a big question but the kind of are you able to kind of walk someone through that process of, of, of at least to some degree what what is happening in that process what what someone could expect through that process mm -hmm. um, can you can you just tell me on that one yeah I guess kind of just walking through walking through the, the whole process mm -hmm. of when someone comes down what yeah. what are they getting themselves into how are these people working mm -hmm. and because you know it's I think we often uh, we, we tend to compartmentalize things a lot like this is Western medicine or this mm -hmm. is Eastern medicine or this is Shipibo medicine but at the root, it's it, it's all medicine. It's trying to to heal. It's trying to teach us. But obviously, the people are working in a, in a very particular way, which is something that's quite maybe foreign to many people. Uh, the idea, for example, of doing a diagnosis, I think that's pretty, in a way, normal to people. You go to a doctor. He has to he or she has to diagnose you. Like what's wrong? Whether maybe in, in some of the the ways we're more familiar with it, it's through speaking, like, hey, what is wrong with you? Or a lot of allopathic doctors may have certain tools, uh, uh, yeah. you know, listening to your heart or looking at your tongue or taking blood samples and, and seeing what's, what's out of balance, what's out of alignment. Um, but with Shpiwa, it, it's a bit different in that way. They, they don't necessarily have like a a whole array of physical tools, uh, but they have tools, and, and so there's again there's there is this process of diagnosis of, of seeing what remedies may be mm -hmm. good um, through the song, through the ceremony, through prescribing certain plants, through as you said this process of aligning. So, yeah, if you could just maybe walk someone through that process. Mm -hmm. Mm. So first of all, um, and as you was you were beautifully beautifully reminding the other day, uh, it's like medicine is for everybody, but not everybody is for the medicine. So the first part of the process is uh, um, for us to um, to see whether someone is um, would benefit from this work. Um, and that there are different aspects to it. There, first of all, there is, um, is potential someone having the, um, the, the mindset that is required to really understand the seriousness of their work and to really take on the, um, the, the discipline uh, that is required for that, for that work because not following those requirements can be um, very problematic for the person who will come for healing. Um, generally, you know, things that we came to heal if we haven't, if we consciously have made the decision not to follow those requirements, those things can come back sometime worse um, you know and different kind of situation can arise which are not desirable um, so for her is is um, the first part is of her work is, is to you know pass on the message as clearly as possible um, of how profound and serious this work is um, so when we see that um, someone has that openness um, and that willing to go along with the process and that willingness to go along with the process and again the trust and that faith 
um, and um, even though you know obviously a lot of us would come to that yet and we have deep trust issues you know but some of us are really really lost in those trust issues and 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 some of us you know are really deep into it but they are still you know able to reach out just a, enough so that we can we can take the hand and say come on you know it's just like the image that i i, I always have i like to use is you know we can sometimes be lost into something and then we just have our head down and then we are not even able to look up but sometimes we are really you know just kind of head is under the water but we are able to bring our head hand out and ask for help and then what you know we can do is we can grab the hand and just kind of help people out so that that's a very very important element of it um, and um, so when we have um, been able to to see that you know the person wants to come would benefit from that uh, data um, and also um, medication wise you know because there are some obviously there are some medications which which are contraindicated with ayahuasca but still, a work with my, a master plan is possible, you know, because in the master plan, the ayahuasca is not really that important. What important is the work with the master plan, and uh, so we can give a master plan to someone, and the person wouldn't drink ayahuasca if that's not possible. If the person cannot stop the medication, but still really needs a healing, so that the body can start healing and maybe just kind of, you know, eventually come out of medication if that's possible. Um, so when we have worked out, you know, that all the conditions are fit for us to be able to receive someone and really help them and that we can really work together as a team, then as they, as they arrive, um, you know, we have uh, work preparation, more instructions and, uh, and you know, cleansing with, with steam bath. And then the first ceremony is, um, you know, we have private consultations as well as the maestro. But as they say, it's like the, the private consultation, they are more for us. They're not so much for themselves, you know, for the maestros. Because everything that they really need to know, they will they will see it in the in the diagnos in diagnostic ceremony. As Maestro Jose says, he doesn't actually like to have too many informations because they in order to find um, you know what they really need to find they need to look for it but if we give too much information then they will be you know working with what they've been given and maybe there's something behind you know that they might not just kind of go and look for uh, so it's really is is um it's really a work for them of looking for things so in the diagnosis ceremony that's what they're going to be doing you know they will be you know scanning the, the body physical energetical um, you know, mental, emotional, spiritual, and again, as they say, you know, they don't have a crystal ball, you know, they just, you know, it's not like they see, um, you know, everything in details, but um, they see energies, you know, and they, they don't spe spe specifically see, you know, the story behind, you know, but they see the energies and that is what, you know, they, they, they remove and they work with. And so the, the, in the diagnosis ceremony, obviously they work, you know, with the ayahuasca, which is, you know, the medium that allows them to connect with the master plants um, that are the real healer, the actual healer, and uh, that, you know, opens their vision so that they can see what's uh, what's happening. And um, so in the first ceremony, they would be working with the ayahuasca and the Icaros. But the Icaros is already the master plant because they everything they they have learned it's taught by the master plans so when they're seeing an ikaro is um the ikaro is is taught by the plants and the 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 strength that come out you know that makes the the voice um medicine is the strength and the medicine of the master plant the vibration, you know, the melodies, the rhythms, everything is being taught by the by the master plan. So when they sing, it's like it's like the tool that they are using, you know, 
the, the, that actually the, the master plan doctors through the maestros are using to, you know, to heal and align and, and obviously you know, in the diagnostic ceremony they will already start to do some cleansing work and, um, and you know, start bringing the necessary alignment as well to prepare the person even more to be receiving the master plan. Um, from that ceremony as well, they, they will see which plant is connected to the patient. So which plant is um, required for um, the patient to work with. So that's why, you know, we obviously, you know, they, there's always an, an, um, an invitation, especially for people who have done DIADAS before, you know, there's always an invitation for, for people to just say if they feel a specific connection to a plant. Um, and then the maestros will check but you know they will only give the plan that they see is actually connected to the person and um and well at gp what are we are uh lucky enough to have uh, um you know for our center to be in the middle of a huge land that we are um you know we are taking care of and we are protecting it's, it's quite you know around 60 hectares of land full of incredible and sometimes very rare medicinal plants and so the master plants that um, we are working with we we can go and harvest them in the forest so then usually I mean the next day after the ceremonies then we the dance ceremony that we go to the forest if the rains you know if it's not raining too much and then we can actually do that um, so that the, the dieters themselves can go and physically meet the plant and, and ask for permission to diet and, and leave an offering. And, um, and then the plant is prepared and, you know, by the maestros and it's been given um, that, you know, that night, that night itself. And so from that moment is... Um, is a really it it very much becomes a a personal work. Is is the master plan is very personal and and it it's best to be as isolated and as silent as possible so that we can actually make a um, um, you know deeper connection with that with the plan and you know it's just like when we are you know meeting them. Um, um, a new love interest, you know, is just like ideally, you know, we spend some day just together and just to really, you know, dive in that relation so we can really make a connection. And so that's the same with the plant, you know, the, the more with the plant we are, the deeper we can go in the connection. So the days are um, ideally, you know, filled with as much tranquility as possible. Um, drawing, painting, playing music, you know, everything that really can uh, um, bring us joy, you know, and, and allow the plant as well to uh, inspire us. Um, so that's why, for instance, we don't recommend, you know, reading books too much um, so that whatever comes out, you know, can really come from the plant and, and, and whatever we do can be an expression. Of the of the, of, of the plant, um, <clears throat> so traditionally, um, in Adiera, there's really not much of ayahuasca drinking at all. Obviously, in this kind, especially when someone comes for two weeks or a month uh, of healing diera, there is quite a lot of ayahuasca ceremony because it's another kind of work. And, and every ayahuasca ceremony allows the maestro to, with the caros, to work with the power of the plant that we are dieting, that, you know, we have within. Um, but traditionally, it would just be, you know, one ayahuasca ceremony in the beginning and one ayahuasca ceremony in the end, even though if the master plan lasts a year, you know, even just one drink of master plan, then that's what we diet. So a lot of the work really happens when we are by ourselves um, during the day or during the night, you know, the, the master plans work very much with our dreams as well. A lot of the testings 
happens in the dreams and they're in the days as well and master plans um the era, um heal and learn through through tests which can be sometimes as insignificant as a, a mosquito but a ring you know but the thing is just it's constantly it's like they say it's like the master plans are constantly attacking us to see how we're going to react and according to how we react first of all it you know it has potential to bring up feelings uh that needs to be healed but the question is really how we're going to react to that the idea is not to react basically to anything so that it's we stay in the idea of one line of thought you know if i'm reacting to something basically i'm feeling you know that emotions feel whatever that i come to heal but if i manage to breathe and and and, and work with it um and uh, and reach out to the plant in that moment you know then the healing happens so there's a lot of healing uh and work that is being done during the day when even we might feel like nothing is happening but a lot of it happens in that moment you know it's in in within our concentration um within this context of a you know shorter healing the eras obviously the mysores are there constantly and uh, whenever um someone has you know a difficulty during the day um we have facilitators there whether to accompany the process and you know they will be translating but they will also um help a guest to um you know understand the way that master plan data works and, and instruction had been given in the beginning but it's just kind of really reminding and just kind of guiding the people through um the process to help them pass the test and um and if it's necessary the heater comes and and you know the work with tobacco and agua florida put any cara we need during the day and and to blow the person you know if the mind is going to crazy or if the emotion is too strong and uh if they are physical situation they will be addressed with um extra plant remedies if necessary or body work and definitely pretty much every day we have either um um sauna so um steam bath which helps to um cleanse and 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 purify the the body but also the thoughts and uh and and so the emotion you know the energy and definitely from what we you know bring from the inside what is pollution you know alcohol chocolate all this kind of thing but also you know what we carry and that we actually you know the deeper things that we carry that we come to heal and then we have the um the flower bath which are um most of them given on the on the ceremony days which are also cleansing and purification for uh, for cleansing for purification but it also is to um you know calling for good energy so you know good luck protections and so it's really good to enter in a in a ceremony with them so i with everything with ceremony that happens during the those uh, during this healing year at times they will be working with the you know with the medicine they have inside the master plan they have inside and uh, and with the master plan that the patient um has inside and together with the ayahuasca mm -hmm. how about that idea of, of ayuno why is of fasting why is why is that so important mm. Mm. As Maestro Jose likes to say, it's like when when you when you pay for a master plan, you you know you pay the for the center, you know, for, for the healers, for the workers, for everything that it involves, you know, maturely, you know, for for the master plan to be able to happen. But we still have to pay the plant for their work. Uh, so part of this is the offering that we. We give when we go and ask for permission to be able to die in the plants, but um, mainly is with fasting. Fasting is actually an offering. So when we say fasting, we mean like dry fasting, um, which is um, no food and no water, no touching water, as well as no drinking. And it's something that uh, 
the plants respond very well to. So we um, we really encourage people to do as many fasts as they want, but again, because it's an offering, there's something that really has to come from once, you know, because it has to be your personal inspiration, but it comes, you know, it, it usually comes, you know, very, very quickly. It's just the, the work itself just kind of really invites for that, and the plants and the ikaros and the medicine just kind of really invite, invites for that. So as we, as we are fasting, um, ideally it's also not to be, you know, reading during the time, to be really speaking as much as, as little as possible so that we can give our full presence and attention to the plant and to the gift that we are giving. And it's, it's really, you know, with every fast there is this intention, an intention that comes. But, you know, intentions, you know, are somehow very simple. You know, just, you know, heal me, teach me, give me strength. And and in exchange for that, I'm, I'm going to give you, you know, my fast. I'm going to give you that um, full attention and dedication. And uh, when we fast, the, the, the process goes much deeper and much faster. Um, the plants, you know, come close. And... Um, it's during a fast, things can come up more strongly as well. Um, so, it, for some reason, it's like whenever I'm doing a long fast, it's just like there's always a moment where, you know, things are coming up, you know, more strongly. And then eventually, you know, I remember, oh, yeah, I'm fasting. So it's okay, you know, it's going to pass. So it's, it's, uh, it's, it's really this phase where things are working in a deeper way. Mm -hmm. What do you think is the point of all of this work? I think it really depends on, 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 on each one, really. Um, because, you know, people come from different kind of reasons. Um, people come because they, they have, you know, strong physical illness and they haven't found any medicine elsewhere, or maybe they've always been, you know, in a passive alternative, alternative medicine and, you know, the sickness arise and then that's, you know, that's the only way that they want to consider to heal themselves. Some people come because they have addiction, some people come because they have depression, some people because, you know, they're, they're kind of okay, you know, but they are looking for something deeper, more meaningful in their life. Um, some people come because they want to learn. I think it really depends, you know, on, on on each on each one and and how deep we want to go as well. Some people come for one time and after one day that they have enough, you know. Some people come for three times. Some they just keep on coming and and um, but I think that um, a person, you know, my personal hope uh, or my maybe the reason why I'm doing that is is. Uh, First of all, I hmm. is I have I have this profound trust in in the beauty and the uh, noble true essence of humanity. And I am longing, you know, for humanity to remember themselves. And uh, so I'm longing that for myself, uh, you know, obviously I'm longing for that for as many of us as possible. So I think that the deeper we go with that work, the deeper we give ourselves the opportunity to awaken that memory of ourselves and, and and walk, you know, on that path of love and light and and uh, and, and the more we give ourselves the, the tools to master that. You know, you were talking about dominate, mastery, that you know, that word that they are 
dominar, as they say, they say in, in Spanish, um, this having having mastery of. Um, so mastering, I think ourselves, you know, mastering. Um, it's like, for instance, you know, they say. Like we have to master energies, you know. It's like when we uh, when we are learning, and we have to learn how to be able to get drunk and master that, you know, not to just kind of, you know, fall into the, um, you know, being all drunk on the road. But we have to be able, you know. Sometimes my sister says, my sister says, you know, when you drink, you start singing a nickel. And learn how to master the energy or you know with the, the energy of the moon of women you know that's also something that me as a woman I have to learn how to master that because there are so many things that move when the moon comes you know emotionally mentally and everything so I have to learn to master that and if I can learn first of all how to master my own energy and just remain in that place of center remaining in the place of center doesn't mean not go out of it but just know how to come back to it so know how to use my pipe and my Agua Florida so that I can cleanse myself and I can, um, you know, recenter myself um, so that I can also, you know, be around people and meet women in their own time and not being myself affected by it. And then I can help them, you know, I can put protections, you know, that's what they do, you know, when there are women in their own time in, in the ceremony, you know, they put, because they master that energy, they can put a protection, you know, for no one to get chucked. Um, so that's really, you know, yeah, mastering um, a path of illumination, illuminations, you know, how to, because illumination doesn't just come one day and then stays there. Like balance or health is not something that we reach one day and then here we are. It's mastering that, you know, going off it, coming back, and going off, but like not too much or less and less, you know, out of the way so that we can, we can come back to it. In the same way that, that certain certain of these plants maybe imbue or embody certain qualities, like maybe ayahuasca more of this feminine, or wachuma more of this masculine, these these master plants also tend to embody certain qualities, which is why if someone is suffering from a certain thing, one plant may be given rather than another one. So they, they all have different characteristics in a way, but do you think it's like you said, it, everything is, is, is very different, very varied? Or do you also think there's some overarching message or something that these plants are all also pointing towards on a more universal sense uh, for, for humans, for people who work with them? I, I, I thought that. And then I was absolutely convinced that that's the message that I received from plants. And then, uh, and then, apparently, you know, they laughed at me when I said it. As if plants don't work like that. Um, yeah, I don't know. It's still a mystery for me, you know. But it's it's very interesting the thing about messages, you know. Um, they it's like the the, the at least the shipy boards, you know. They are they are not. Um, what they say, you know, um, medicine is not about bringing messages. It's that's definitely a very, you know, Western thing. Um, you know, my strainess apparently says, you know, she loves and she said, you know, after so many years of drinking medicine, you know, I never received a message. Um, you know, what they receive are, uh, um, you know, visions, dreams, indications, you know, that, you know, help them to teachings, you know, that help them to help someone, to heal someone. That's what the, the medicine is about for them. Obviously, that doesn't mean that there's never like a, you know, um, you know, an understanding of something, you know, that you could call message. Uh, but it's mainly, yeah, it's mainly a tool to, you um, you know, align things, heal things. So, you know, for instance, um, maybe let's say we have to do a travel somewhere and then, you know, the maestro is going to, in a ceremony, is, is going to have a look at it, you know, and feel if that's aligned or not. 
you know, if it's not a line that is going to see that can be a line, and if it can be a line that, okay, maybe we don't go. That's more, in my understanding, that's more how it, how it, how it goes. Um, and obviously, you know, there can be inspirations that come, you know, inspiration for a work that needs to be done. Um, they don't call that messages, though. But, you know, again, just like my my experience and my understanding is, is limited to what I'm myself able to, to see. Mm -hmm. Do you have a sense of your, your path going forward from here? Do you have any vision of that in a way? Or you're also just taking things how they, how they come? At the moment, I'm very much taking things how they come. It's just uh, every, it feels like every certainty that I had, you know, about the path or visions or things that I wanted to create or um, has, um, yeah, faded away with the last day that I actually did. And it feels like an incredible place um, because I feel more open to, you know, whatever opportunities and surprise and uh, surprises that, um, you know, are coming my way, which is, you know, the prayers that I always put out, it's just, you know, my life is full, full of opportunities, and but I never know that it looks like what it looks like at the moment. So uh, I, I know that I'm on my path, definitely, and but I'm, I'm discovering at the moment every day where more than ever, why it leads me. You know, I have, obviously, I have desires. Um, but I don't know in what shape or form it's, it's going to manifest when it does. Mm -hmm. Well, I don't have a clock on me, but I'm guessing we're coming up in two mm -hmm. hours. <laughs> Is there anything we, we didn't touch on that you'd like to talk about? Mm. I know that there are some questions that you asked that I somehow kind of, you know, didn't answer, but no, yeah, I don't know if, if that's good for you. Then. Um, I don't know, maybe, um, obviously, you know, my allegiance is to Shibiborao, so if, if you wanted to ask any more things about Shibiborao itself, but maybe Jose can do that when, when more, much better than I, I would when it comes to well, if people are interested in contacting you or Shippy Bo Rao, what, what would be the best way of doing that? Well, we have um, we have a website, uh, which is shippyborao.com, and uh, we have the, the best way to actually contact us is it's good to go on the website first to just kind of have an idea of you know um, you know a sense and a feel of what we what we do and um, how pretty Shippy Borao looks like. And, uh, but if you, you know, if people actually want to contact, we have an email address, which is shippiborao at gmail.com. That's the best way. And, you know, Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, we are really, um, you know, in line with our time as much as we can. Mm -hmm. And and you're in charge of, of answering all of those messages? Yes, I am. I, I am at the moment. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know team is growing and we are always looking for more and more people to help but at the moment i'm in charge of the yeah the website and answering and, and you know the different means of communications mm -hmm. and if anyone wanted to reach out to you about anything else is that still the best contact or is there another contact anything else such as i don't know anything else yeah um wanting to do an interview with you <laughs> right okay well i think yeah, I think, um, well, this, this is another, I have more personal email for work, which is earth.medicine.path at gmail.com. Um, but that one, or Shikibura, or, you know, I'm, I'm even Shikibura, I'm, I'm always going to get the message. So, you know, I'm on Facebook, I'm on Instagram as well. So, yeah. Well, thank you, Emma. This was, this was beautiful. And uh, thank you very much for sharing your wisdom. It's... Um, I think this work is growing in a very big way, and, and there's a lot of people doing these practices. But I, I think there, there's there's few and far between who are really giving it the dedication that you have, and, 
and just all of your experience and you can really speak to it from a, a very humble way, a place that comes from experience, a place that comes from knowledge and, and you do that very beautifully. So thank you. Thank you for having me. And you, you made it. <laughs> I did, my God. <laughs> yeah. Great. Yeah. All right, everybody, that's it. I hope you enjoyed that episode with Anne Laura. Uh, I, I really enjoyed sitting down with her. I think she has a lot to share. Um, and yeah, it was really a pleasure for me to, to be able to talk to her. And, and I hope you all enjoyed that. As always, if you are able to support this podcast, that's a really big help to me. Patreon is a really good option. Uh, it's a, subscrip a subscription service for as little as a dollar a month. You can sign up and it gives you some really nice added benefits, things like early access to shows, bonus material, Q&As. So to all the people who have done that, thank you very much. As always, I really appreciate your support. And if you are able to do that, that's a really big help to me to be able to make and produce and shoot and all of the things that it takes to, to make this podcast. So um, I'll put a link to that in the show notes. Um, and then as always, if you're able to support the podcast just in the, the little ways of, uh, if you're listening to this on YouTube, hitting the um, subscribe button, turning on the notification bell, liking the video. That's always a really big help. Leaving any comments in the comment section, sharing the video with, with friends, with family. Um, there's the ability to direct donate via PayPal. I'll put a link to all those in the show notes as well. Um, also with the YouTube channel, you can now join the YouTube channel as well. And that gives you a lot of the, the same perks as the Patreon page. So yeah, I think, uh, like I said, the, the next episode is going to be with Jose. Uh, that's a really good episode and that will be coming out in two weeks. So I think that's it. Thank you all for tuning in. I hope you enjoyed this episode and I will see you all on the next one. Doom.